I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker, Ellen Nolan from uh, Eriba. Uh, so Ellen, just come up here and uh, I think I have your slides ready to go here. Um, so whenever you're ready, yes. uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing a fantastic meeting. I think uh, your ability to get all people in the field here to give a talk is amazing. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. Um, so what I will talk about today is our work on uh, modifiers of protein aggregation and toxicity in aging and age-related diseases. And as you all know, uh, due to the increased life expectancy of the world population, the number of people suffering from age-related neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer and Parkinson is expected to increase tremendously in the next couple of decades. Uh, by 2050, it's expected that there will be around 130 million people worldwide suffering from these diseases. There's no cure for the diseases, and also the cause is not fully understood. Um, what we do know is that many of these neurodegenerative diseases have uh, one thing in common, and that is when you look into the, their brains, the brains of patients, uh, these contain these abnormal protein deposits and they are located for each disease diff in different parts of the brain but when you zoom into these deposits you can see that they're built up of fibular structures and these fibular protein structures are built up of misfolded uh, disease specific proteins for example amyloid beta or tau in Alzheimer's disease alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease TDP43 in ALS and frontotemporal dementia and so on and so on so we know from familiar forms of these neurodegenerative diseases that when you have multiplications or mutations that make these proteins more aggregation prone, um, that, that will lead to uh, early onset forms of these diseases. And uh, when these proteins are put into model organisms, these model organisms capture features of neurodegenerative diseases. And what is striking is that also in sporadic forms, which are much more abundant than these familiar forms of the diseases, these proteins are found in uh, these deposits. But how these proteins cause disease and how they end up in these aggregates is still not fully understood. What is known is that our cells can protect themselves against aggregation prone proteins. And when they're young and healthy, when these aggregation prone proteins appear in the cell, they can use uh, refolding machineries like molecular chaperones uh, or degradation machineries like the proteasome or autophagy to protect themselves against the aggregation prone proteins. But during aging and in, during disease, these machineries uh, get less capacity. And so that's why these aggregation-prone proteins accumulate, self-associate, and end up in these uh, full-blown aggregates. Um, so uh, we do know quite a lot about the refolding machineries and degradation machineries, and uh, people are trying to boost these mechanisms as a way to start treating uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, but we know very little about uh, how the proteins uh, are toxic, why they are toxic, what drives their toxicity, and what drives their aggregation. And uh, to my opinion, if we can find these, then inhibiting these mechanisms can be used uh, complementary to, to boosting the protective mechanisms to treat protein toxicity. Uh, in age-related diseases. So that's why, with my group, we asked the question, what are the biological mechanisms that drive age-related protein aggregation and toxicity? So uh, we use C. elegans in the lab, and one of the approaches that I want to talk about today involves a uh, forward genetic screen using a model for polyglutamine aggregation, where we looked for mutants in which uh, aggregation was suppressed. And we found seven of these mutations, which we call MOACs, or modifiers of aggregation. And two of these mutations were particularly uh, interesting. And those were in uh, MOAC2 and MOAC4. And that is because they suppressed aggregation without affecting the uh, level of the polyglutamine protein. So first, I will tell you something about, very briefly, a summary of what we found from MOAC2. And most of my talk, I will spend on MOAC4, for which we have now data on the human variant, uh, human orthologs, and the mouse orthologs. Okay, so what was MOAC2? We found that MOAC2 was a, uh, uh, turned out to be a regulator of RNA polymerase 3 
in the regulation of the transcription of small non-coding RNAs. And loss of MOAC2 loses the ability to transcribe small non-coding uh, yeah, uh, non RNAs. But that was not the reason why loss of MOAC2 protected against protein aggregation. Rather, in the presence of polyglutamine, uh, the expression of small non-coding RNAs was down to begin with, and moreover, the MOAC2 uh, was translocated in the presence of polyglutamine to the cytosol, where we found in biochemical assays it was capable of driving the aggregation and toxicity uh, directly. And this showed that uh, aggregation-prone proteins are not only able to inhibit vital processes in the cell, but also to hijack uh, vital uh, components of cellular functions as, uh, way, uh, as mechanisms to accelerate and enhance toxicity. Whether this activity of MOAC2 is related to ex its activity in uh, small non-coding RNA transcription or not, that is something we still remain to investigate. But now for MOAC4. So MOAC4 turned out to be a very small protein of unknown function, highly abundant, disordered, highly charged, and it's evolutionarily highly conserved. And in human, there are two uh, orthologs called small EDRK rich factors, one and two, or SURF1 and SURF2, of which SURF2 is the most uh, homologous, homologous protein. So we found for MOAC4 that uh, its loss of function suppressed protein aggregation, but it did not only suppress the protein aggregation, but also the toxicity of polyglutamine because the loss in motility uh, that is caused by polyglutamine over time is suppressed by the lesion of MOAC4. To our surprise, it not only suppressed the toxicity of polyglutamine, but it also suppressed the toxicity of alpha synuclein and A beta, as shown here. And um, uh, this loss of, uh, of this suppression of toxicity was accompanied for A beta and also for polyglutamine by a shift in the aggregation intermediates in the worm, suggesting that the loss of MOAC4 drove the aggregation process in another direction. So, so uh, subsequent studies by us and others have shown in the meantime that this function of MOAC4 to drive aggregation is conserved for human surf as well. Uh, it, it is independent of downstream known chaperone and degradation pathways. It seems to be specific for amyloid forming proteins and uh, it does not co-aggregate with, um, with the aggregates. Uh, rather, it seems to turn an aggregation prone protein into a conformation, an aggregation intermediate that then catalyzes the formation of amyloid. But then the question we, that we asked was if if SERF can, and MOAC4 can act on all these different amyloidogenic proteins, how does it do it? What does it recognize? Because they are structurally and in sequence, they are not similar. So to investigate that, we make use of a peptide array screening approach where we had 27 full-length human amyloid proteins chopped into small pieces, and we put them on a slide, and we added a, a SERF labeled uh, SERF to it to see to what peptide sequences it bound. And what we found was that actually the, the, the discriminating factor for binding or not binding of SERF was the presence of uh, negatively charged amino acids. And uh, these uh, segments of negatively charged amino acids appear to be present in all the uh, proteins that we tested, and uh, except for one, the human IAPP uh, amyloid protein, Oh, in general, the binding of SERF was directly related to the negative charge of the segment in the protein, uh, except for, for some uh, where we found that the binding was actually stronger than predicted based on sequence. And from that, uh, we extracted the information that the presence of hydrophobic residues next to it is enhancing its binding. But overall, charge drives the interaction, and that is further confirmed by uh, looking at uh, or when we, when we neutralize the charged of SERF in its evolutionary conserved, highly uh, charged uh, N-terminal domain, we found that the, the, the protein could no longer bind to the peptides. So then we wondered, is this indeed what is driving also its catalyzing effect for amyloid aggregation? So we first went to in vitro studies with purified disease-related proteins. And what you, can see, what you can do there is you can have these proteins, they form amyloid in a test tube, and you can monitor that by thioflavin T uh, binding. 
and uh, you can see that if you add surf, then you can accelerate this, this uh, uh, amyloid aggregation. But if the charge is gone, this acceleration is gone, and the same is true for alpha synuclein and amyloid beta that we tested. And uh, in the absence of a charge in the amyloid protein, like we found in the uh, AIPP, uh, IAPP protein, their uh, surf has no effect nor the, nor the loss of the charge. Uh, but, of course, that's in vitro, and in vivo you have a lot of other charged molecules, so does this extend to its aggregation uh, promoting effect in, in vivo? So for that we went back to the worms, we CRISPR mutated the, the locus of MOLOC4 and uh, changed the charge, to, uh, neutralized the charge, and uh, what we found was indeed when we had a control mutant, nothing changed to the, uh, in the aggregation, but when we... Uh, strongly reduce the charge of MOLOC4, we found that it could also suppress aggregation. And moreover, when we did cross this charge mutants and control mutants with a, a, a worm expressing amyloid beta in its nervous system, we found that also uh, the charge mutant could reduce protein aggregation, and moreover, it also suppressed the toxicity of A beta in the nervous system, which we measured by looking at pathogen avoidance that's regulated by the nervous system of the worm. Uh, normally, they would be able to avoid pathogens, but when a beta is expressed, this is lost. But when we uh, mutated the charge in uh, MOLOC4, this uh, was uh, largely restored. So this I find remarkable because it means that changing the charge of a single protein in uh, an organism can completely change the way they cope with uh, aggregation-prone proteins. Um, so from this, we conclude that uh, MOLOC4 serve actually drives protein aggregation by uh, charge interactions with uh, amyloid, amylogenic proteins. Now, um, does uh, inhibition of serve also alter disease-related pathology in the brain? That's the question that we would like now to answer. For that, we went to mice and we made surf uh, knockout mice. Uh, first, we made a full body, uh, body uh, knockout mouse but that turned out to be perinatally lethal, indicating that in contrast to the worm, SERF has a role during development. But then we turned to uh, brain-specific knockout mice, and that was viable and showed uh, no um, abnormal behavior. So we used that and crossed it with an APPS1 uh, mouse model for amyloid beta aggregation, and, uh, and looked at the effect on aggregation. And I will show you just a few data. First of all, SERF knockout did not change the levels of A-beta, just like MOC4 deletion did not to the aggregation pro proteins in the worm. And second of all, what we found was that SERF knockout had an effect on uh, the um, deposit uh, structure. So what we found was that the knockout of SERF led to a more compact and more dense um, amyloid pattern. Now this is, of course, uh, just a few pictures, so we wanted to do this more quantitatively. And for that, we turned to uh, LCOs, dyes that have been previously used to distinguish different uh, polymorphs of amyloid in a human brain. And, and that in this way, uh, these can be associated with disease severity and disease type. So we used this in these, in these animals. And what we found was that the serve knockout mice actually changed the amyloid structure also when staining with these LCOs. Now, of course, uh, this is where we got. Uh, of course, we now need to know whether it also changes the toxicity of the A-beta protein. But for so far, we find that loss of SERF slows development and causes perinatal lethality, as I mentioned. Uh, this I didn't show, but it affects proliferation in a cell autonomous fashion. Uh, the brain deletion of SERF does not affect the viability of the mice nor the A-beta levels, and brain deletion alters the structural composition of amyloid deposits. So in sum, I think I've shown you that we have been able to find modifiers that affect the uh, aggregation and toxicity of uh, aggregation-prone proteins. And we found from MOLC4 that this was uh, evolutionarily conserved. But whether these functions are uh, their physiological functions or acquired functions in the presence of aggregation-prone proteins, that is something we still need to determine. So finally, I would like to acknowledge the people involved in this work. First of all, my group, uh, Anita Pross, Esther Stoll, and Janssen in particular, who did most of the work on the uh, biochemical and mouse studies, and then all uh, our dear collaborators that contributed to various parts of this project. And I would like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, uh, Ellen. Um, we have time for some uh, questions. There is uh, one in the back to begin with, and then there was a lady in front of the one in the back. Great talk. So I had a question. So does surf have the same uh, uh, proteins with ISIS, or it does it differently, like based on charge or anything? The, does what? Does the surf, surf one? S E R F one. I mean, the, uh, no, the paralog. Yeah, that that has the same. Yeah, has the same uh, charge, the same uh, domain composition. So it, it recognizes the same. So do you think there will be a rescue or something if you knock out only surf two from surf uh, one? We so I don't know whether there will be a rescue or partial rescue, but we in in uh, in human cells we can individually knock them out and they both have the same effects and we don't see an increase in the surf one levels in the brain. So that we checked. But this, uh, whether it can compensate at its level, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, you showed that it changes the aggregation structure. Yeah. Um, did you have a chance to do like cognitive experiments? No, it was so it, it, it has been very complicated. And we have been starting to do this. Uh, and so far, unsuccessful, because we, have, we wanted to use a different mouse than this one to get good uh, signal. And there, there was an epilepsy phenotype, so we had to actually kill the whole cohort. So we don't have the data. So that's why I also want to talk to Matthias Jucker, who, who made these mice, if he already found a trick to look in a different way to the toxicity of these mice, because it's, it's essential. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Ellen. I really appreciate your uh, talk. And thank you. Uh, remember, if, uh, if you have questions, you can post it on Slack also. And Ellen can hopefully go on Slack and, and check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we are ready for our